Hello, welcome to Coonrod's Corner. My name is John Coonrod. I am a marketing development engineer for Rogers Corporation Advanced Circuit Materials. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking about PIM, which is passive intermodulation. And, and specifically, I'm going to be talking about PIM in regards to printed circuit board antennas. Now, PIM is a, um, a source of interference, and it can be a source of interference for many different systems. In this case, we're really going to be talking about PCB antennas, but uh, let me give you a few scenarios here. The first scenario would be if you had a radio station, and the antenna's on top of a mountain, and it's out by itself, and there's only one channel, one frequency is being transmitted and received, in theory, you will have no PIM issue. The problem is, is when you look at some of the uh, cell stations, and uh, all the antennas up on top of the tower, these, uh, each of these antennas can be transmitting at different frequencies. And what the issue is, is when one antenna is transmitting at a different frequency than another, they can actually mix frequencies and create their own uh, signal. And that created signal can cause interference with other things. So PIM is an interference issue, and it's an interference issue with multiple systems and not a single uh, radio system, so to speak. So, uh, I've put together something that's just a kind of a quick drawing of what I'm trying to explain here. And if you were to look at a system that has two antennas that are transmitting at two different frequencies, F1 and F2, what can happen is that these frequencies can mix in a nonlinear fashion to create uh, harmonics. And these harmonics would be a third order harmonic or third order product, fifth order, seventh order. But anyway, the, the key is, is this frequency uh, that is a harmonic of these two transmitted signals that are mixed together. Anyway, this signal that pops up out of there, actually if that's the right frequency and it gets in the receive band of a receiver, now you're receiving this noise that these guys generated and the receiver will not be looking for that kind of information. The receiver is looking for other information. So that's the problem with PIM. That's how the interference works with PIM in a very general sense. Now, uh, PIM can be uh, a lot more than just antennas. PIM can be related to cables, uh, connectors, filters, power amplifiers. PIM can be related to just about anything in the microwave and millimeter wave industry. Uh, however, PIM can be a very big issue when it comes to printed circuit board antennas. Now, the amount of variables that uh, are to con be considered for PIM for a PCB antenna are pretty substantial. And uh, I'll give you a quick list. Um, there's things like the connector, the type of the connector, the design of the connector, how well soldered it is, how much solder, how little solder, how well the solder was cleaned. Uh, there's things like the grounding around the circuit. There's uh, ferromagnetic materials. If there's anything magnetic near the circuit, that can have a big impact on PIM. And then finally, uh, uh, there's also a material issue, actually there's several. And one of the more significant material issues is copper surface roughness. We have found the copper surface roughness of the laminate being used to make the PCB antenna can be a very significant source of PIM. Now we've uh, went through the formulation of our materials that are used in the PCB industry for antennas and we formulated the substrates to be very good for PIM as well as the, uh, the conductor as well to where it is a very smooth conductor obviously. And we've done a lot of studies over the last 10 years on this very topic. Now what I've shown here is um, a PIM testing that we did with the exact same material, just different lots of materials. So this is one lot of material, this is one lot of material, and this is four circuits out of that lot, and this is another four circuits out of this lot. And what we did was PIM testing, so we're looking at the passive intermodulation of these circuits built on these materials. And what you can see is the grand uh, average is pretty close to both of these uh, panels or materials that were used, which is good. But you can also see, if you look at the numbers, that you have like a minus 146 PIM reading in here. And in reality, that's actually a pretty good number. But um, that's still not as good as we expect this material to be. And if you look at the other numbers, it does stand out as being an anomaly. And what that really is, is really an artifact of the test method. So in the test method, there's many things that can cause the PIM to be lower but we found there's nothing in the test method that could cause the PIM to be better. Uh, so the best number we can get on PIM is just the nature of the material and the test. Uh, so what happens is when we see a PIM number as low as that, we typically realize that that is due to the connector not being seated properly or dust in the contacts or many other things. And normally we discard that. But the higher PIM numbers we do not discard. We keep that because there's nothing that we can do to actually make the PIM artificially better than what it truly is. Now, uh, Rogers has been working on this for many years. We've spent at least 10 years doing studies on PIM. We formulated our antenna materials to be very low on PIM. And uh, a PIM number, just for reference, uh, kind of a rule of thumb, the, uh, a PIM number of minus 145 uh, dBC is considered pretty good. A PIM number that's more negative than that, a minus 150 dBC, is really good. And many of our materials are tested at one, minus 155 dBC and even as good as 160 DBC. So these are considered extremely good. 
If you'd like more information on PIM, we have that on our Technology Support uh, Hub website, and we invite you to come and join that where you can find information on PIM as well as other uh, information um, regarding the high-frequency circuit materials. Thank you.